Welcome to Leaders of the West, a podcast for innovators and change makers. I'm your host, Jesse Jarvis, the founder of Of the West, and I'm sitting down with agriculturalists, entrepreneurs, executives, and everyone in between with the goal of digging into the strategies, mindsets, and lessons that have been crucial to the success of ag and Western. Whether you're carrying on the next generation of your family's operation, starting something from scratch, or determined to climb up the leadership ladder, we're going to inspire you to continue to dream big, growing not just you, but the future of agriculture and Western as a whole. Let's go. On today's episode of Leaders of the West, we are sitting down with Katie Beal Brown, the founder of Lone River Beverage Co. and what you guys probably know best as Ranch Water. Katie, thanks for hanging out with us today. Thank you so much for having me and congrats on the new podcast. Oh, thank you. So to kick things off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career and the beginnings of Lone River? Absolutely. So I grew up in West Texas um, in a small town, and my family actually settled out there about 100 years ago. And my grandparents have a working ranch in far West Texas. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the geography out there, but Texas is a very big state and far West Texas is very remote. So we're about three hours from the closest city in far West Texas, right in between um, Midland and El Paso. So growing up out there, you know, spent a ton of time with my grandparents and it's been the foundation of my family. We've had a lot of big milestones out there and there was a drink called ranch water that my family has been drinking for as long as I can remember out at our ranch. And traditionally it's made with tequila soda lime, but as with most great Texan things, there's actually a legend behind it that it was originally concocted by a wild haired rancher in far West Texas, actually near the town called Fort Davis, which is the same spot as my family's ranch. And after drinking um, the drink, it had him following miles of Texas stars until he fell asleep under a pinon tree. Um, So I always really loved that legend. And as I grew up and went further away from home, I kind of used this drink, ranch water, as a way to tell people more about myself and where I come from, because I'm sure with most people growing up in a rural area, when you mention the name of a town, it kind of goes over people's head um, unless they're familiar with the area. So it almost became like my party trick in introducing people to ranch water. And as I started to see more and more people interested in what it was and they were telling their friends, I felt like there was really something there and it was a drink and a story that people were interested in. And so that's what kind of got the wheels turning for me and starting to think about, okay, is there a way that we could actually package this and build a brand around it that celebrates where I come from in West Texas and the culture that's associated with that? So that's kind of the long and the short of it. I love that. Well, and really, when you think about like New York and drinks and I mean, tequila, soda, lime, that is a very trendy thing. But when you walk up to the bar and you say, hey, can I order a ranch water? And people around you are like, what is that? That is like the instant, like, I don't want to call it an icebreaker, but kind of like a conversation starter. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it just like naturally piques people's curiosity. And then it really, for me, just opened the door to talk more about where I come from. And, you know, it's a place that not a lot of people have really been to, even in Texas, because it is so remote. So yeah, that's kind of how it all started for me. So let's walk back to the beginning of this product. You didn't come from a background in the food or beverage industry. So how did you figure out where to start, and what steps you needed to take in order to create the ranch water product. So yes, I had absolutely zero experience in food and beverage, especially alcohol, which is high barrier to entry in industry, you know, a lot of regulatory complicated factors to even get into it. And I will say like in starting any business, I think the hardest part is really taking those first few steps because you just have no idea even where to start with some of these things. So I really just started by kind of talking to anybody that I could get my hands on or get on the phone with about like the industry that had products that I really respected um, to understand like how they got into it and start to just get a framework for, you know, some of those first steps that we need to take. And then separate to that, I actually spent most of my career in branding and advertising. So 
I was very naturally kind of gravitating towards like the building the brand piece of the business. And that part for me was very fun because I was very inspired by where I come from. And then, you know, the business side was something that I had, there was a very steep learning curve for me because I didn't have that kind of financial experience or experience in the industry itself. So it really started by just trying to get the time of, of as many people as I could to understand, you know, what this would take to actually even create a product and get it out there. So how long was it from the day you said, okay, we are doing this, we're going to create our own drink in a can, if you will, until the day that you could walk in a store and find ranch water on the shelf? So it was probably about three to four years for when, you know, the idea was like bubbling in my head to actually having the product on shelf. And part of that was, you know, I was working a full-time job. And so this was really something I was exploring on the side and trying to kind of chip away at slowly over time. And the other piece was, I think for a long time, it took me a while to get the guts to really say, I'm going to go out and do this. And so I wasn't sure, like, is this something that I want to take such a big risk on and quit my job and put my own money into? And so I think part of that was like, you know, I would do a little bit of of it at a a time. And then there came a point where it was really hard to ignore that we did have a business. It did need, you know, a leader at the helm full time. And so, you know, right as we were kind of coming up on like three years of working on this is when I started to make the move to quit my job. We went and raised money and started to put all the pieces in place to actually put the product on the shelf. But yeah, I mean, it was actually a very lengthy process, but it wasn't me just working on it full time that entire time. But I think that that's something that people don't necessarily realize because in most people's mind, they probably think that ranch water is kind of an overnight success, right? They'd never heard of it before. And then all of a sudden, that's the only thing that anybody's drinking. It's the only thing like you see it taking up such a large space in your local grocery store at a liquor store, right? So I think that that just goes to show how often we think, oh, well, that was an overnight success. But in reality, an actual overnight success is, I don't know, the smallest of smallest percentages, right? Products do and businesses do take so much time that I don't think that people realize that and can easily get discouraged by that too. Yeah. And I think, and it's kind of the saying of like a 20 year overnight success. I mean, there's several of those in the alcohol industry and I do think, though, something that was unique for us is after we launched, we very quickly started to feel the momentum. And that's where, for us, even it did feel somewhat like an overnight success. Because once we were in market, I mean, we were just, I think somebody described it as drinking from fire hose and trying to, you know, keep all the wheels on the bus and keep it moving forward. But yeah, I think as you're kind of chipping away at an idea and wondering what it's going to look like when you bring it to fruition. I think for me, a lot of it was about the mindset. Like in my life, I've always been the kind of person to set these really big goals. And it's never truly been about achieving those goals, but it's been more about the process of getting there and challenging myself and really, you know, the way that I'm learning and growing along the journey. And so I think for me, like I just loved the idea of having this really big dream and this really big goal. And, you know, if it was a huge success or not, that didn't really matter to me. Like I cared more about what it would take to truly challenge myself to start a business and bring a product into the world versus, you know, how quickly I did it or how successful it was and all of that. And I think in a way, because that's always been my mindset, I think the success kind of followed suit. Because even when, like, even in this business, when I have felt like, wow, we've kind of made it, like this is a big deal or a big milestone, I never really truly celebrate them because the goalpost then moves further. And I feel like I'm trying to achieve something even greater than what I thought I would achieve, you know, when I was starting out, if that all kind of makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because something that you have said to me before is that personal growth is far more valuable than achieving the goal. So that's goes back to a lot of what you just said about really enjoying the journey, not having so much focus solely on the destination. 
But because of that, you've also said that you're a lot more willing to take risks because you aren't so fixated on the end result. You know that regardless of the outcome of the risk, you're going to learn from it, you're going to grow. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Because I think that that is a mindset that is so valuable, especially for our industry. Yeah, I think, you know, part of it for me, like it's never really been about success or failure. And I've been asked a lot, like, what do I feel like is my biggest failure in the process? And it's always a very hard question for me to answer. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, does that, is it because I just, you know, really think that I haven't failed at all? And I think the reason why, like after kind of digging deeper, it's not because I haven't failed. I mean, I fail every single day. I've made so many decisions that weren't the right decisions, but I think because it's less about the success or failure for me, it's more about the process and what I've learned and how I've grown. And even moments that could have been in others' eyes looked at as a failure, in my mind, they have been reframed as an opportunity. It's been an opportunity to learn and grow and get smarter and stronger and do things better and be more competitive. And so I think that's, you know, when you're getting into this, like, for people that are maybe thinking about starting a business, you know, just thinking about it in the sense that I have never felt like a single part of this has been a failure. And so, you know, when you're thinking about starting something, your biggest fear is I'm going to fail. But if somebody told you that you're never going to fail, if you look at this as a personal growth opportunity, then, you know, I think that completely like eliminates the risk in your mind because it eliminates what you look at as maybe your biggest fear. Well, and along that too, I think when we fail, we still have knowledge. And one of the coolest things about knowledge is at the end of the day, no one can take that from you, right? It's not like you learn something and then if you don't use it, you lose it. I mean, occasionally there are those types of instances, right? But once you've learned something, you usually have that lesson or that knowledge with you for life. So you can then grow, make better choices, you know, make different decisions at the end of the day. So really, I mean, in a way there, there is no such thing as failure. Yeah, I love that. I think that personal growth is enduring. And I will say like on both sides of it, you know, I've had moments that have felt like maybe like great success or achievement, but they're very fleeting and it's easy to get caught up in them. You know, you think about like a moment, how do you define success? Is it making a lot of money? Is it getting published in like the Wall Street Journal? Is it, you know, what is that, you know, vision of success for you? But I will say like, I feel like there have been a lot of moments like that for me, but they're very fleeting. And at the end of the day, like it's not necessarily the thing that I'm carrying with me and that's motivating me on a daily basis because I have realized how fleeting they are. Um, And on the other side, like same with what could be deemed like a failure. You know, I've had moments that have felt like such a low moment, especially I've gone through this journey and had two kids in the process. And there's been times when, you know, I've looked at my husband and said, I don't know if I have the capacity and bandwidth to do it all. Like, I don't know if I can be a good mom and a good business owner and a good friend and wife and all of that. Like, I just don't have enough bandwidth and have felt like, you know, these really low moments, but they also have been very fleeting. And so I think if you realize that too, it makes it much easier to kind of go through the process and journey and say like, none of this is going to be enduring. Like none of these feelings are going to stay with you forever. But what is, is that personal growth and what you're able to kind of challenge yourself to do and how you're able to evolve because of that. Well, and two, I think that in the moment failures feel really, really big, right? But if I, even for me, like if I were to think back on all the times, which I probably feel failure on a daily or weekly basis, right? Let's be honest. But If I were to go back in my mind at this very moment and think about like, okay, what was a big failure in my life? Mm -hmm. There are a ton that stand out. And I think for that, and not because I haven't made them, which I obviously just admitted to, and I'm like, I'm proud of the failures that I've had. But the point is in the moment, they feel a lot bigger than they are. They are kind of that blip on the radar, if you will. Yeah, no, that's very true. I think, yeah, and it is funny, like as you keep going throughout a journey, how the magnitude of them kind of evolves. Because there definitely have been moments where I'm like, I don't know, like, is this going to keep moving forward or not? Which might be surprising. I think everybody gets a front row seat to the highlight reel, but they don't always see 
you know, the sacrifices that we have to make in those moments that are really hard. I mean, it's not that, I guess like, it's not that I don't feel like I have failed or had hard moments. I have hard moments every single day, especially being thrown into, you know, entrepreneurship and having to be a business leader at a scale that I was never really equipped to be a leader in. You know, I never, I never went to school for anything like this. So it's all been learning on the fly and having to figure it out. I love that. I want to go back real quick because I do want to talk about the the beginning in the sense of it took three, four years from when you started to when you had a product. Most people would probably want to quit in that time or feel like the risk of that was just too much. So did you ever have doubts or what kept you motivated in those early years before you had a product to sell? Because obviously it's really easy to kind of keep going when you have a product, but before you have anything to market, what really kept you motivated in that? Yeah, I mean, I think I always felt very drawn to entrepreneurialism, even from like being a small child. And it's kind of ironic because my family has a family owned business that's been passed down through generations. And so it's not like my family has this incredible entrepreneurial pursuit. But I always grew up around my dad always had these crazy goals and things that he did, even beyond the family business that I always really admired. And so I think like, it's something that I, for some reason, always felt like I was going to start my own company in some way or form or fashion. And Lone River and Ranch Water was kind of the first idea that I felt really motivated to keep pushing forward. And I think because it was so connected to who I was and how I grew up and the culture there that it just felt like something that I could really bring a unique perspective to. And so, you know, in the early days, I just had this like blind optimism of, I think this could be something. I think I could be the right person to do it. And so I just kept kind of pushing it forward, even though, I mean, even my husband, you know, in the early days, like I would spend our own personal money um, and we were living in New York at the time, like we didn't have a ton of money. I would spend it on, you know, working with designers and trying to bring it to life. And there were some times that he's like, listen, like you need to be really careful about this. Like you don't want to lose all our money on something that maybe never comes to fruition. But I always just felt like this pull to keep moving it forward. And in a way, I think it was a journey like way bigger than myself and something that I was just meant to do, which sounds kind of odd for an alcohol business. But but yeah, I think there was just always this invisible pull for me to keep moving it forward and keep moving along. I love that. In that same time frame, thinking about other people who may be in that early business journey right now, what kind of things do you wish that people kind of realized about building a successful business and the importance in those early years? Yeah. And I guess thinking back to one thing that I did kind of before I had even taken a single step in doing something to like really bring the idea to life, I would talk about it with a lot of different people. Like, oh, I have this idea. Like, I think this could be something really cool. And I really distinctly remember at the time I was working at this ad agency in New York, and I mentioned it to the head of the agency just as kind of like a, you know, I think this idea could be cool. I might explore it. I don't know. And I remember her saying, well, why the hell haven't you done it yet? And that was such a pivotal and memorable moment for me. And just like thinking to myself, like, why haven't I done it? Like, why am I wasting time? Why don't I just start moving this forward? And so when I think about other people that want to start a business or do something entrepreneurial, I love the mindset of like, why the hell haven't you done it yet? Just take that first step. It's the scariest and you have no idea what you're doing, but you have to get, you have to take that first step to get some momentum so that then, you know, that leads you to the year next step and next step and next step. And now here I am, you know, three years down the road from selling our first case and I have a full blown business. And if I hadn't said, you know, why the hell haven't I done it yet? And taken that first step, I would have never been here. 
Ooh, that that right there could just sum up this whole episode, because I think that that is so true about you have to take the first step. That's Mm -hmm. once you complete the step, you have a little bit more confidence. Confidence creates momentum. Action creates results, right? Like it is you kind of are a hamster on the wheel in the sense of like you've done one, you have the momentum, you can keep moving forward. Yeah. And I think like even the first step, I mean, it's never like a linear journey. It's not like you take one step and then the next and next and next. And like you look back and you're like, oh, like, you know, that was really progressing. I mean, you're kind of in the beginning, you feel like you're like a ping pong ball, like just all over the place. But like it does kind of start to make sense and accumulate into a journey because, you know, you take one step and then that leads you into a a certain direction that then you know, progresses into some kind of like momentum of a thing. And that's where I think once you get that momentum, it's more about just keeping it going, but to get it started is the hardest part. So anyway. No, in reality, business building is kind of like painting by numbers, right? If you if you just take the one color and you you put it all the places that you're supposed to, it looks like, well, what is this going to turn out to? But when you're done with, you know, putting all of the paint in the right places, it actually is a, you know, like a beautiful picture with the exception of that in business, there are no numbers. There isn't necessarily a guide. If only there were a paint by numbers to starting a business. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Paint by numbers without the numbers and they don't supply you with the paints and you have to pick, pick your own portrait. Oh gosh. Well, and I, in the beginning too, I always said like, what do I have to lose? Like, I mean, obviously (laughs) I guess you can come up with a lot of things if you really ask that question, but Like I really just, you know, I I said that if nothing else, I'm going to learn a lot through this process. And so I think looking at something that way and really assessing like what is your own appetite for risk? Don't ever put yourself in a position where what you feel like you have to lose is so much that you maybe couldn't recover from it. And so I think that's also like why for me, like doing it slowly, the what I had to lose was very small until, you know, we got to a fully scaled business. And now I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) now I probably have a lot more to lose. (laughs) Okay. So instead of asking you about a failure, I want to ask you, what is one of the biggest risks that you took that then paid off the greatest? So when we first launched our business, so we sold our first case in April, 2020. And at the time, like our distributors were very hesitant. They're like, we'll buy a couple thousand cases from you. We're not sure this is going to work, but we'll put it out there. And so after that point, we like immediately started to sell out and our distributors started to come back to us saying like, can we get 30,000 cases, 40,000 cases, 50,000 cases? So it was this race for us to scale up our entire like supply chain, which this was in the midst of the global pandemic. It was very complicated, especially, you know, having really no experience in running a full-blown supply chain. So I think the biggest risks that we took was really the capital that we were putting out to scale this supply chain with no guarantee of the growth and if that growth would be sustained. And I very distinctly remember a moment. So there was a global aluminum can shortage. So we had to get very creative in how we were even finding our aluminum cans. And there was a point where somebody found this resource where we could get, I think it was like a million cans, um, but we were going to have to wire this company that we weren't even really sure was legit, like a lot, a lot of money, almost all the money that we had in our business bank account at the time. And we kind of looked at each other. We're like, what if this is a fraud? (laughs) And we've just sent all this money away and we get zero cans back. But it turned out that we got the cans and we were able to really scale up our business by taking that risk in a way that a lot of other people weren't, because I don't think they were willing to take the risk to put out that kind of capital at a time when there was so much uncertainty. And so anyway, I think that was... That was really a moment where we were like, we're either going to be in a lot of trouble or this is maybe going to be the greatest decision we've ever made. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. Who who knew aluminum cans were such a risk? But obviously <laughs> in, the, in the beverage business, they are an integral part of your product. <laughs> yes. No aluminum cans, no product. Oh, well, to round out today, I want to end on a recent personal highlight for you. In the last month, 
you were named to Ad Week's 2023 Creative 100 list, which celebrates the top 100 standouts of the year in marketing, media, and culture. So what does that mean to you? So this really felt like a full circle moment for me because, you know, when I was working in advertising, I started from the bottom and really just, you know, worked as hard as I could to keep moving my way up. And I would always read these advertising publications and think like, only if I can get a job at that agency that they talk about all the time or work with that person that won that award. So to actually be one of those people is very surreal. And one of the reasons why we got this award was for the way that we've really built a community around our business. And you know, I think that to me makes it even more meaningful because one of the best parts of this entire journey for me has been the people that it's connected me with and people that I would have never gotten to know otherwise. You know, a lot of them I've gotten to know very personally, gotten to know their families, and I think they'll be in my life forever at this point. And community, I think too, you know, working in advertising and working with a lot of big brands, I think these brands forget that the consumers are real people. And so we really approached our business differently because our consumers were a real point of pride for us. And we wanted to get to know them as people because the fact that they believed in what we were doing meant so much to us and it still does today. And so we wanted to build actual relationships with them. And I think in the business world, We just, we forget about that too often. And I hope that no matter how big our business gets, that that is always the foundation that it's built on and that we always have the opportunity to get to know our consumers as people and really build relationships with them over time. Um, And I also, you know, separate to that, I'm just so grateful for all of the support that people have given us from all the support that we've gotten from the Western community and a lot of the cowgirls like yourself. I think. That's what's really kept me going in the moments that have been more difficult. And having those people that have said, like, keep your chin up, just keep moving forward. I never imagined that I would be able to build like these deep relationships through this journey and this process. And I'm just so grateful for that. Ooh, ooh, I love that. Okay, so I'm going to go into the rapid fire round. They are not necessarily rapid fire answers, but it's the, the set of questions that all guests get. The first one is, what is the best piece of business or personal advice that you've ever been given? Hmm. I think, you know, early on, one of our investors said something to me to the extent of change is is constant and your ability to adapt to change will define your success. And it's just something that I have always kind of kept with me throughout this journey. And I think it's part of too, not getting too attached to your success or failures. Things are constantly changing and it's really critical that you're able to evolve with that change and move your business forward and even evolve your own role in the business um, as it starts to grow and change as well. If you could give people any words of wisdom and you knew that they would take them to heart, what would it be? I think it's just back to the you know, why the hell haven't you done it yet moment for me. And really just about taking the first step and thinking about the process in your own personal growth versus getting too hung up on what you think the end goal might be and whether you're going to be successful or not successful in that. So I think really, you know, it's the first step is the hardest one to take, but taking it is such an important I think it's such an important growth opportunity for you as a person. If you could go to dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? I think it would be my great grandfather. You know, I, through this process, have just gone back to a lot of the history of my family and what kind of the pioneering spirit meant to his generation and even the generation before him. And I just think it would be so cool to get to sit down and have dinner with him and understand what it took for him to really like start a business, what it took for him to settle in a new place and all of those things. Because I think the pioneering spirit then and today, I think there's a lot of threads that are pulled through, but you know, it was much different when it was the Wild West. 
Oh, absolutely. You want to talk about risk takers. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. I think everybody in the 1800s and early 1900s, they were all risk takers. I don't know what has changed about our culture. Maybe not much has, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think you you had to have like a different kind of grit and resilience then. Um, that I just, I would be so interested to hear even his perspective on like what I'm doing today and and, you know, my own appetite for risk as well. What is one quote that you lead your life by? I think like just back to the personal growth piece is never define yourself by your successes or failures. Both are very fleeting. And so I think it's really important that there's something deeper and that that is, you know, like your personal growth versus something very specific. Oh, That was the perfect way to end this conversation today. You are such a wealth of knowledge. And I can also tell you right now that we're going to have to have you back for a future episode specifically on the topic of storytelling, because that is something that you and your brand do so well. And it's really what has continued to connect the West and your spirit and your pioneering heritage with the rest of the world. And I know that our listeners would love to hear more on that. But Because I know that people are going to want more of you in their lives, where can people find you online? So you can find me um, at Ranch Water on Instagram or at Katie Beal Brown. And thank you so much, Jesse. I can't believe we haven't met in person yet. I hope this year is the year that we get to meet finally. Oh, it absolutely will be for sure. If this episode was helpful for you and you know of somebody else that may need to hear it in their lives as well. Do us a favor, take a screenshot, show us that you were listening. Don't forget to tag of the West, tag Katie, Ranch Water. Show us that you're responsibly enjoying your ranch water. That would also be a fun, a fun little thing. Um, and be sure to hit the follow or subscribe button so that you guys never miss an episode. With that, we will see you guys next week. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. If you loved this episode, do us a favor and share it with someone else who might find just as much value in it as you did. We're on a mission to continue to grow and strengthen the future of agriculture and Western industries, and you spreading the word helps us make more of a positive impact. It also makes a big difference when you take a minute to go rate and review the show. We can't thank you enough for listening, for sharing, and for loving Ag and Western as much as we do. We'll see you back here for our next episode.